I'm Heather, a lifelong Austinite and lover of art, culture, and local creative communities. Join me on a quest to interview engaging artists working with a variety of media, from paints, sculptures, fabrics, theatrics. Come along as we discover the meaning of blank canvas ATX. In today's episode, we watch wax become art and question a robot without a heart. Hi, I'm Amy Todd. I am here with Gigi Grinstad in her lovely home and we're here to show you her art and talk about her life as an artist here in Austin, Texas. Tell us where you're from originally. How did you end up in Austin? I grew up on the West Coast. I was born in Minnesota but I don't remember living there. I lived in Portland. Um, when I was a kid we lived way out on the coast in Washington and at some point uh, Maybe about seven, eight years ago, I started being cold and tired of living in the Pacific Northwest, and it's actually like the inverse of days that it is here as far as like sun and not sun. My friends had a sublet in this house actually, and they said, just come and hang out for a couple of months and you can sublet the room while the one of us is gone. And so I did. <laughs> I didn't intend to stay for a long time when I got here, but then I loved it. I've always wanted to make art and my mom had a lot to do with that. She's a watercolor painter. I didn't go to art school. Um, I did study art in school, but mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I went to like a, a hippie college. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is a hippie college? <laughs> Describe, <laughs> please. I want to go to there. <laughs> It was fun and horrible at the same time. You get uh -huh. to design your own major, so you put all oh. of these like 18-year-old kids in uh, in small classrooms, and okay. then they teach you how to, you know, critical think and all of these things. But you also get to decide what it is you want to learn about. Everybody is just experimenting, doing whatever. Like you have to sit through through these like horrible final pro <laughs> final projects <laughs> that people do, and you're just like, oh my god, kill me now. <laughs> But you also like learn to be not trapped into one discipline or another mm -hmm. discipline, which I think most of the higher education in this country is all streamlined in that way. Um, and so I can't say that it's benefited me monetarily, but it's benefited like the way that I think and the way that I approach mm -hmm. problems and the thing, types of things that I think that I can do or have access to doing as an artist. You know, I don't have to stay super regimented into like one thing. Maybe past 10 or 12 years, I've been working with encaustic medium, which is like beeswax and resin mix. One thing that I like about it is that it smells nice when you work with it, and it's like this tactile kind of, you have like a texture that you're using. And then because it's wax, it has a little bit of translucency. So there's um, like a, a depth that happens. So it's not like actually luminous but your light is reflecting off the surface and it's reflecting off the base surface as well. Encaustic is my favorite currently. I don't know if it will always be my favorite. So I've got this hot wax on Ooh. this um, hot plate here. What kind of wax is this? So this is um, beeswax with a resin mixed together and the resin is called Demar Crystals and you can get it at the art store in like a pound bag. Ooh. And so it looks like this. Okay. And then these are some different colors of beeswax that I just have broken up with like a hammer and a, mm -hmm. a knife. So you mix these things together and heat and heat them up. The Demar crystal makes the wax more, um, like more durable and a little bit less malleable. If you want to, you can take these things and mix them together and then add powdered pigment, which is a step that I usually just completely forgo. I just use the oil paint on top of whatever mm -hmm. surface. The way that I work with it is different. People do all kinds of different things mm -hmm. with encaustic, but I just take a bristle brush so that it doesn't melt in the wax, um, and then this hot wax mixture on this hot plate, this <laughs> very sophisticated coffee hot plate that I have, and then I brush it on. And it takes a little while, um, and you get these nice brush lines that I enjoy to work with. Mm -hmm. 
if you wanted, you could put also like elements of collage in here. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'll get, do this part and then put a, like a map or picture or a tracing or mm -hmm. something in and then put more encaustic on top. And then there's another step where you take a heat gun and just kind of go over the whole piece. Um, and the point of that is to just make sure that the wax is entirely fused. So this will be the first step. A lot of times from here, I'll take um, something like this where I have like a design element or a drawing, like this might've been the thistles one before. And then if you have it with pencil, you can do the, um, like flip it and then do a, a like a transfer. Okay. So uh, this is a piece you're working on now, and uh, you've already got your encaustic uh, wax on there, and see some tracing, and I see some carving too. Yeah. So the way the way that I've been doing this process is, um, I'll transfer the whole drawing like I was doing, and then this is a um, one that I have transferred the whole drawing, which in this case is a snake with these flowers. And then every place that there was a line, um, I went ahead and carved with this carving tool. So it looks just looks like this. And this carving tool is a very sophisticated old screwdriver. <laughs> I was like, I <laughs> that know, just, that looks familiar. just happens to have like the right size of point. So yeah. I end up using this more than <laughs> anything else. Um, and so I just carve all the lines that I have drawn. And um, that part is probably the part that takes the very longest. Um, and then once they're pretty much all done, like they are here, I go ahead and take one of my oldest, grossest paintbrushes and get a really nice um, kind of sloppy mix of whatever color I want the lines to end up being. So in this case with this snake, they're gonna be kind of red-brown. Mm -hmm. So I've got some red-browns over here and I just mash them in, right? Oh, wow. And so, the paint's just getting really deep into every line. And a lot of people are familiar with like a, how, how a tattoo would work. It's mm -hmm. essentially the same. So you're just mashing the ink down in there. And then after I do the whole piece, typically, I take a paper towel or an old rag and then wipe it all away really? from the surface. That's yeah. It. So then you have like the reveal of yeah. what it is you're working on. So you, then you have um, all of this, maybe you see some lines that you missed and you'll go, go back in, but then, um, then I'll take sm my small brushes and um, lighter colored paints or different colored paints and paint in all of the scales, for example, or all of the petals of the roses. So what do you think about the Austin art scene when uh, compared to when you moved here? I feel like there's some things that are happening which are both good and bad. There's like more of us and so that's good. But I feel like there's like the crunch now of like space and money and time and uh, like a more kind of faster paced, mm -hmm. which is part of why I moved here was because it was slower than where I would had been living in Portland. I do feel like there's a lot of support for the arts though. Like if I'm working on things, I get feedback. If I show, show my work, I typically sell something. Like I might not sell a lot of things, but there's like a lot of energy coming back at me if I'm putting things out there, like I'm getting something back. What is a blank canvas? I think for me personally, it's like this moment where you have, maybe you have like all this stuff sifting around in your brain or you have something you've seen or heard and that's like influencing the way that you want to make something. So you have this like kind of like jumbliness, right? And then you have this moment of stillness where you figure out a piece of what you want to do with that thing or things. Like, so maybe it's like a distillation is that like, that's the blank canvas, right? Like that's the, whatever is that like 
the seed that's trying to get out of all of that stuff is like that little bit of quiet right before you start actually making the thing, like the structure that you're gonna make. I think that's the, I don't know, maybe that would be like meditation or something in a different avenue than art making, but it's kind of the same, I think it's all kind of the same thing. Hello, Mr. Winterborn. Heather, hello. How are you? I'm good. What are you up to? I was just donating my copy of the Alphabots to this take a book, leave a book box. Oh, how generous of you. Yes, well, I was actually on my way to the studio if you'd like to join me after I'm done here. Is that where you make these Alphabots? It is, yes, Fantastic. I can show you around. Fantastic, I would love to join you. I'm Heather with Blank Canvas ATX, and I am in the Winterborn workshop in Austin, Texas right now with Mr. Winterborn himself. Thank you for coming here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be Mr. Winterborn. Oh, that's a big one. It's kind of a tough one. I was working as an artist and, um, I guess I got a bit bored. I wanted to do something new. I wanted to do something um, a little bit more fun, a little bit more public. I had just seen Exit Through the Gift Shop. It really inspired me. And it made me want to go out and do something. I figured if, if Mr. Brainwash can do it, then so can I, and, and why not? I was already a sculptor and I started taking those sculptures and putting them in parks and putting them on the streets and buildings and stuff like this. And it just kind of took off and I started to have fun with it. Where are you right now in your creative process? Like what's exciting you right now to uh, design? This thing right here is pretty <laughs> exciting to me. This is a Aquabot sculpture from my book, The Alphabots. Uh, I did a illustrated alphabet book with all different types of robots. And A is for Aquabot, who explores the deep seas. And this is Aquabot as if she was a real girl, like a real person in a suit. Um, so this will be a street art piece, and I will be installing it in cities across the country. I started sketching robots when I was doing street art. I, I started doing uh, cardboard robots, and those sketches led to the book. The book led to this sculpture. <laughs> it's very symmetrical, and that's kind of the idea for it. Yes. To make it look like this ancient Atlantean thing yes. that's just survived throughout the ages somehow. I'm so curious about how you came to where we are in Austin, Texas. You know, how your journey from wherever. Came down here for, you know, reasons unknown. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I am today. Reasons unknown. It's that kind of a BS a answer, mysterious. isn't it? Yes, that yeah. sounds a little mysterious. Kind of dodgy. Yes. I wouldn't trust it. Maybe there was some love involved. Mm. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> have you had your heart broken a couple times, Mr. Winterborn? Oh, I'm a robot. I don't have a heart. <laughs> <laughs> don't you think that inspiration and in art comes from the heart? I do. I absolutely do. Ah, and without a heart, where is it coming from with you, Mr. Winterborn? We're very curious about step by step how you go about creating such pieces as the Aquabot. Yes, I can show you on a smaller scale so it's so it's easier. I've got the mold for the uh, for the Steambot head that I use in street art. So this is the Steambot. When that's done, I'll put it on a table and I'll cover it in rubber. And that's what this is. You would see that Steambot would come right out of here. Yes. So this is the rubber and then... Steambot, is that what you said? Yes, that's what I call that. Yes, this is the steam bot. And then over the top of that, I build this rigid shell so that the rubber keeps its shape mm -hmm. when the sculpture's not in it. Mm -hmm. So here's the rubber for that steam bot. So, oh, wow. so you can see if I didn't have the outer shell, it loses its shape. So yeah. it's very hard oh, to, I see. to cast it in plaster. Because of the weight right. and everything, putting right. it in there. So I, I wanna just kind of get a, a sense here. If you look inside um, his signature of his work, is actually right here on the edge. Um, and what is that, Mr. Winter, Winterborn? What it's uh, IW. IW. For Impossible Winterborn. Impossible Winterborn. So that's really wonderful. We go over here and I'll show you how, 
how I pour the material in and then pull the, uh, the actual sculpture out of this. Oh, fantastic. Oh, how exciting. Okay, so these have been in the molds for long enough to where they've set up. I can just take them out. This is the log art sculpture. I usually put this on trees. It's like an uh, English goblin. This is a uh, skull bot, a little robot I designed to go on doorways and bridges and different things. Oh, how wonderful. Almost like a door knocker, maybe. It reminds right. me of something like that. This is actually one of the first faces that I started putting on places. Her name is Ashley. Become kind of an icon because I've been using it for so long. Is there a story behind Ashley that you would like to share, Mr. Winterborn? It was at the beginning of when I started doing this, and I was like, hey, let's cast your face. <laughs> and then let me put it in every city in the country. In some ways, it's a little bit of robot affection. Sometimes she says she's flattered, and other times she says, where's my compensation? <laughs> she's, she's actually a very good sport. <laughs> So here at Blank Canvas, what we, one of the things that we really like to, to figure out is like what the Austin art scene is right now. I would like Austin to commission more interesting pieces. They could take risks. If you look at other countries, you see their public art, the works of art, the sculptures, they're insane. They're absolutely insane. I think that more imagination needs to put, be put into public works. I mean, Austin does do a pretty good job at having some really decent art festivals and um, good outlets for uh, artists to express their work and, and show their work. Perhaps an indelicate question at times, but I think it's really important that artists are appreciated for their work. And one of the ways to show appreciation for artists' work is by people purchasing their work. Are people buying your work? Sure, yes, yes. People do buy my work. My, my work is available at uh, AO5 Gallery. Yearly I do the Blue Genie Art Bazaar. People can always come to the workshop and take a piece off the wall if they want it. My robots uh, pay the rent. You were telling me earlier that you have like a favorite, you know, and so... But right now she's my favorite. She's your favorite right it's now. It's usually the one I'm currently working on is the favorite. And I think that's the way it has to be because if you're only obsessed with something you've done in the past, then how do you ever progress and move forward? Mm. I feel like being in love with what you're currently doing is probably the most important thing. Mr. Winterborn, I really, really appreciate you letting us into your, your studio, your workshop, your place of great inspiration. Like I said, I appreciate you coming by. I appreciate you spending your afternoon with me here. And I would actually like to give you a copy of the Alphabots to take with you. Oh my gosh! So that's yours. This is amazing! <laughs> Can't see a thing in here. You're lo you're great. It's so dark. You're great. <laughs> I like this blank canvas thing.